Ironically, this section actually begins not with Romania, but with Hungary, as in 1867 the Hungarians revolted against Austria, and Austria was forced to agree to the dual monarchy arrangement, whereby the empire was hereby known as the Austro-Hungarian Empire, with two monarchies ruling the empire. However, for Romanians, the important part was the fact that Transylvania was now a part of Hungary in the nation. Then, only 10 years later, the Russians and the Ottoman Empire went to war again. The 11th time now? But this time, Ottoman control in the Balkans collapsed, with Bulgaria, Serbia, Montenegro, and Romania all gaining their independence. Russia, however, would betray Romania, demanding that Romania give up southern Bessarabia for their national pride. Romania refused, but this caused Russia to order its troops in Romania to occupy the capital. Romania would be forced to lose the part of South Bessarabia they controlled. However, the Ottomans, not wanting to border Russia and the Balkans, offered to return North Dobroja to Romania. In 1912, the Balkans united to remove the Ottomans from the peninsula. Perhaps the only thing that can unite the Balkans. With Bulgaria, Greece, Serbia, Montenegro, and Albanian rebels all teaming up to kick some furniture ass. But the Bulgarians wouldn't be satisfied with their gains, as they failed in achieving the conquest of all the land they wanted. And becoming known as the Prussians of the Balkans, they attacked neighboring Greece and Serbia to take Macedonia. However, they got more than they bargained for, as the Ottoman Empire and Montenegro joined the war, and Romania proved true friendship dies hard, as it joined the fight to defend Serbia. Bulgaria was then defeated, and Romania took the remainder of Dobroja. In 1914, the Austro-Hungarian Archduke decided to take a stroll in Bosnia, and found out that Slavs don't appreciate being ruled by Germans. Weird. But he ended up getting shot. The Austro-Hungarians did not take this well, and gave Serbia a list of demands. Serbia accepted all of them but one, which would have demanded that Austro-Hungarian police be permitted to operate in Serbia with impunity, which would have transformed Serbia into an Austro-Hungarian puppet state. However, they offered to work together with Austro-Hungarian police to find the suspects. Naturally, the Austro-Hungarian Empire was just looking for an excuse, and invaded the tiny Slavic state, starting the Great War. Romania's King Carol I was of German descent, and as such favored joining the Central Powers. However, the Parliament supported joining their close ally France in the Entente. Things were complicated by the secret treaty of alliance that Romania had signed with the Central Powers, along with Italy in 1883. However, as Austria-Hungary were the aggressors, the agreement was null and void. King Carol soon died in October, and King Ferdinand I far more preferred the Entente. On August 4, 1916, the Entente outlined their promises to Romania if they joined the Great War against Austria-Hungary, including granting it all of the territory of Transylvania up to the Tisa. This culminated in the Z Hypothesis. Tell me that isn't a sick name which is the plan to attack into Transylvania while holding off the Bulgarians in the south. As such, Romania joined the war on the 27th of August and blitzed into the undefended Transylvanian territory, scaring the ever-loving life out of German high command, who genuinely believed the war was lost, as there were no troops in the area to stop the Romanian assault. However, the promised Russian support for the Romanian advance failed to materialize, and the Germans rapidly redeployed troops to cover the front. Without any support from the Allies, the Romanian forces were completely overran, and Romania was quickly pushed back from their gains and with Bulgarian support in the south, were rooted out of Wallachia. Romania re-established the front lines in Moldova, but had lost over half the country. In 1917, the Central Powers would try again to finish off the tiny state. However, having been modernized by the French, the Romanians now stood a fighting chance. The Romanian forces, inspired by the French, would shout out, Haidets! Pe aici nu se trece! Come! Through here no one passes! In reference to the French, Il ne passe pas! Or is it, Il ne passe pas pas? I don't, I don't speak French. They shall not pass. The Romanians managed to defeat the Central Power forces, and even began a counteroffensive, taking land back. The Americans even described Romania as the only point of light in the east. However, just as things were looking up for the Romanians, the Russians sued for peace and collapsed into the Russian Civil War. The Romanians were now left isolated, surrounded on all sides by the Central Powers. The Romanians were forced to sign the humiliating Treaty of Bucharest, which would force Romania to give up the Carpathian Mountains to Hungary, give up South Dobroja to Bulgaria, give the rest of Dobroja to a special Central Powers Committee, give all of its oil production to Germany for the next 100 years, and become an administrative puppet of Austria-Hungary. It wasn't all bad though, as in the chaos of the Russian Civil War, Basarabia would declare independence, and soon after join Romania, and the Central Powers would allow it. However, King Ferdinand, upon reading the terms of the treaty, refused to sign it, hoping for an allied victory. And an allied victory he'd get, as the Americans joined the war on the Entente side. And with French and British forces, they would push the Germans back. Romania would rejoin the war on the 10th of November, 1918, and in absolute fear of the terrifying Romanians, the Germans would surrender the next day, 
Romania had brought justice to the Roman Empire. <laughs> but yeah, the central powers collapsed, and Romania advanced into the degrading Austria-Hungary. In this time of sheer anarchy, the Romanians across the empire began the process of independence and joining with Romania. On the 14th of October, the Romanians in Bukovina declared independence and their will to join with the fatherland. And on the 18th of October, the Romanians in Transylvania met with the Saxons in Transylvania and came to an agreement that both wanted to be annexed by Romania. However, the Hungarians did not approve of this 4D chess move, and as such, they disbanded the military. So of course, the Yugoslavs, Czechoslovakians, Romanians, and Poles all jumped on this chance. But for some reason, the Hungarians believed this meant they'd get to keep all of their lands, as long as they granted their minorities autonomy, which did not happen. So in response, the Russians sent a chap named Bela Kuhn to start the Soviet Republic in Hungary, who also announced Hungary would accept no territorial losses. In response to this, the Romanians, Czechoslovakians, and Yugoslavians would inform Hungary that actually, no, I'm afraid you do not get to set the conditions in a diktat. The Hungarians struck first at Romania to reclaim Transylvania. However, the Romanians repelled them, and with their now modernized army, blitzed the Hungarians to the Tisza River. And then, on the 3rd of August, the Romanians reached Budapest, and had some fun times in the streets. After all of this, the Allies drew up the finalized maps for the territories of the nations following the Great War. Using this ethnic map, the Allies determined what had to go where. Romania gained a little more land than Romanians actually lived on, by request of the French for the Romanians to seize the Satu Mare Oradia Arad railway line, a strategically important railway that would help the Romanians, and therefore the French, to better defend Eastern Europe in case the Hungarians, Germans, or Soviets got any funny ideas. And as such, Greater Romania, or Romania Mare, was born. Although the Romanians didn't get all of their promised land, not getting a border on the Tisa and having to split Banat with the newly formed Yugoslavia, Romanians were happy. Finally, for the first time in history, all Romanian land was unified under one state. The Great Union was formed. The interwar years in Romania were a time of massive modernization. Romania had been under the control of the Russian and Ottomans for generations. Not exactly the most modern states. And as such, the Romanians would take after their biggest senpai, the French. Romanians would copy the French in every way they could during the interwar years. All Romanian nobles spoke French. Every intelligentsia member went to study in Paris. Romanian fashion was inspired by the French fashion. And the Romanians even constructed their own Arc de Triomphe, named the Arcul de Triomphe, which the Romanians walked under to show victory in war. All of this culminated in Bucharest, the capital of Romania being given the nickname the Little Paris. Romania also took after France in creating alliances, including the Balkan Entente and the Little Entente. The Little Entente was an alliance between Romania, Yugoslavia, and Czechoslovakia, all guaranteed by France in order to dissuade Hungarian aggression. This alliance would lead to very close relations between the three nations, who all saw themselves as sort of brothers united against a common enemy. Then the Balkan Entente was an alliance between Romania, Greece, and the newly created Turkey to ensure peace in the Balkans. The Romanians also signed an alliance with the new Polish Republic, with the goal of securing against the Soviet Union, who had already gone to war with Poland and attempted to retake Basarabia from Romania. Romania also managed to find massive amounts of oil during the interwar period, making them the largest oil producer in Europe, only behind the Soviets, who, due to their unique situation, weren't the most favorable of trade partners. Fun fact! Did you know a Romanian invented the pen? I didn't know where I put this, so here it is. Romanians also debatably invented the airplane, although that one is more controversial. Then, in 1934, King Zog of Albania granted part of the Albanian city of Saranda on the coast of the Adriatic Sea to a Romanian historian and politician, Nicolae Iorga, who in turn gave the territory to the government of Romania. As such, in 1932, Romania gained its one and only colony, and became a Mediterranean nation although the territory was taken by Italy in 1939. Then in 1933, evil began to rise in Germany. Following the example of former socialist, now fascist Italian dictator Benito Mussolini's march on Rome in 1922, Adolf Hitler and his Nationalsozialist Deutsches Arbeiters Party, or Nazi Party for short, came to power in the German Weimar Republic. This would lead to a series of events where the Treaty of Versailles began coming undone which gave the Hungarians some ideas.
1939, the German Reich staged incidents along the Polish border in a maneuver known as Operation Himmler, soon after invading Poland, beginning the Second World War. But before we get to that, see if you can follow along in the absolute insanity that is Romanian politics of the time. Ready, set, go! After Ferdinand I passed away on the 20th of July, 1927, his son Prince Carol could not inherit the throne due to previous marital scandals, and as such the kingship was passed down to his son, Mihai I, who at this time was six years old. However, on the 10th of November, 1928, Yulio Manu won the prime ministership of Romania, initiating a coup to overthrow the now King Mihai and return Carol to the kingdom, making him Carol II. Yulio Manu stayed in office for one year and 208 days, but is then replaced by Gheorghe Mironescu for five days, until he steps down, returning the prime ministership to Yulio Manu, who takes it for 118 days, then stepping down to allow Gheorghe Mironescu to take control for 189 days, who then steps down from Nicolae Iorga to take control. Mironescu steps down from leading the PNT, and one year and 48 days later, Yorga steps down to allow Alexandru Vaida Voivod, the new leader of the PNT, to take over, who only sticks around for 221 days until passing the prime ministership to Yulio Manu, who, due to realizing he can't deal with the Great Depression in Romania, stepped down again after 85 days to Alexandru Vaida Voivod. However, in t it turned out Voivod was an anti-Semite, which made his party stop supporting him. This coincided with the beginning of the movements of the fascist Romanian Iron Guard, otherwise known as the Legion, which Voivod secretly supported. Then in 1933, Yonji Duca gains the prime ministership, but is assassinated 45 days later for trying to suppress the legion. Then Constantin Angelescu becomes acting prime minister for five days, until Jorge Tatarescu takes over and leads the only successful prime ministership so far, managing to end the effects of the Great Depression for the most part in Romania. However, in the December 1937 elections, it looked as though the legion was going to win a large amount of the votes. And as the liberal Tatarescu's PNL wasn't looking like it could take the majority required, and as the legion was making speeches to end the alliances with France and Britain, and join Berlin and Rome, King Carol acted quickly to appoint the fascist Octavian Goga of the PNC to become prime minister, hoping to secure votes against the radical legion. However, Goga only had support of 7% of the population, and as such, dissolved parliament only 43 days later which resulted in Goga's Lancieri and the legion of Cornelio Zelia Codranu to begin brawls in Bucharest. Goga still continued to pass laws via emergency decree with his anti-Semitism being so blatant that Britain, France, and the United States complained to the king requesting him to remove him, which was exactly what Carroll had in mind as he ousted Goga and suspended the constitution, proclaiming martial law in order to stop the civil war that was brew brewing in Bucharest between the fascist parties. Carroll then created a new constitution in 1938 and appointed the Romanian patriarch Elie Cristia as the prime minister, beginning what is now known as the Royal Dictatorship. During the reign of the Patriarch, the head of the Iron Guard was also found and brought to trial before being strangled to death, causing him to become a martyr for the Legion. However, Patriarch Cristia, being 71 years old, began to suffer from heart attacks and was removed from the office. As his post was taken by Arman Kalinescu, although the Prime Minister still held power in name, all the power was actually in the hands of the King, who proved not to be the best ruler as he embezzled funds chronically and ended up having multiple wives and a lover on the side for whom he often purchased villas. Yeah, the Hoi 4 players in the audience feel that one. Kalinescu in his sick eye patch, managed to avoid assassination attempt after assassination attempt by the Iron Guard, but eventually succumbed to an assassination in 1939, which was supported by the German Nazi party. He was replaced with cavalry officer Jorge Argersano for a solid week, until he was replaced by Konstantin Argetuiano, who happened to be a Freemason. But he was then replaced by Jorge Tatarescu again, who had hardly gotten into parliament when the Soviet Union sent a demand to Romania to evacuate Basarabia and permit the Soviets to occupy the territory. During this time, the Nazi government in Berlin and the Communist government in Moscow had both agreed to an alliance known as the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, which set out spheres of influence for both the powers to take in Eastern Europe. According to the pact, the Soviets were to take control over Basarabia, and the Soviets then moved to secure the province land. Despite the king demanding that they deny the Soviet ultimatum and prepare for war just as Finland did, Tatarescu believed Romania was in no position to fight against the Soviet Union alone, as Romania's chief ally, France, had fallen to the Nazi Blitzkrieg. Poland was partitioned between Germany and the Soviets, and Czechoslovakia had been dissolved into a German-occupied Bohemia and a Slovak puppet state, with Hungary having taken Carpathian Ruthenia. As such, the Romanians acquiesced and surrendered Basarabia and North Bukovina, which was not in the Molotov Ribbentrop Agreement. With this national embarrassment, Tatarescu stepped down and was replaced by Ion Gigurtu, who started bringing Romania closer to the Axis, until August 30th, 1940, when Hungary demanded Romania return Transylvania. The Romanians denied and prepared for war with Hungary, but Germany stepped in to arbitrate the situation. Germany then demanded Romania return North Transylvania to Hungary. Although in a humorous turn of events, a Romanian natural gas tycoon owner would, upon hearing the news, travel all the way to Germany to request they change the plan slightly, so that his natural gas producing area remained in Romania in exchange for giving the Germans a good deal. Which is what that little indent is. 
Romania had to acquiesce as they were in no position to fight the Axis alone, but Gigurtu stepped down shortly after and was replaced by Ion Antonescu, a prominent Romanian fascist. Although the Axis weren't done, and Bulgaria also asked to be given South Dobroja. Germany forced Romania again, and Antonescu accepted through gritted teeth. But the eyes of the entire nation turned to Karol, again, as it was under his reign that Romania had lost the majority of their gains from the Great War. As such, the next day, on the 6th of September 1940, Karol was forced to abdicate, and he fled to Switzerland. The throne was passed to his son, the now 19-year-old Mihai. Then, on November 27th, 1940, following the Jilava massacre, where multiple political prisoners were murdered by the Iron Guard, multiple members of previous governments, including Argetianu and Tatarescu, were all kidnapped and held hostage. However, Marshal Antonescu sent the military to intervene and rescue the politicians from the Iron Guard. In response, the Legion began a rebellion between January 21st and 23rd of 1941, where the Iron Guard mobilized to take Bucharest and commit as many crimes against humanity, and specifically Jews and Gypsies, as feasibly possible. The Legion was so radical in their actions that even the Nazis requested Antonescu put them down, violently if need be. Antonescu agreed, and sent tank companies into Bucharest, putting down the revolt. Whew. And all of that was a brief synopsis of the chaos of Romanian politics in the 1930s. Anyway, during this time the Axis moved to invade Yugoslavia and established a puppet regime in Croatia, who became known for committing some of the most atrocities of the entire Axis. But even with the chaos of the world, true friendships never die, as Croatia, Romania, and Slovakia all formed a new little entente, still trying to stop Hungary from getting any bigger, and Romania refused to allow Axis troops to invade Yugoslavia through its borders. Then, on June 22, 1941, the German Reich declared war on the Soviet Union, beginning what was known as Operation Barbarossa. And after considering it for about two seconds, Romania jumped at the chance to regain its territory. Romania mobilized and began the assault to retake its territory from the Soviet Union. During Operation München, Romania managed to retake Basarabia in North Bukovina. Hitler then offered Romania to take administrative control of all the territories up to the Dnieper. However, Antonescu realized just how many Slavs that would be, and turned down the offer, instead only taking territory up to the Bug River, including the cities of Odessa and Nikolaev. Antonescu hoped he could barter with Germany after they defeated the Soviet Union and retake Transylvania. However, Hitler was planning to satisfy Romania's territorial demands in the east instead of returning Transylvania. Romania continued its push into Soviet territory, helping the Germans in pushing through Ukraine, taking part in the siege of Sevastopol, and all the way to Stalingrad. Romania and Antonescu would actually prove to be Hitler's most valuable ally. Antonescu was the only foreign military general that Hitler would have meetings with, and considered the Romanians' opinions very important in opposition to his view of Romanians in general. Romania also continued to expand its military, and by summer of 1944, Romania had the second largest military in the Axis, right behind Germany, numbering a total of 1,224,691 men, behind Germany's 5,300,000 men, but ahead of Italy, whose military was around 1 million men, but was currently collapsing into civil war. Romania would also contribute more forces to the Eastern Front than all of Germany's other allies combined, with a U.S. Library of Congress remarking that Romania was in a morbid competition with Hungary to curry Hitler's favor, in hope of regaining northern Transylvania. Things started going downhill, however, when the Germans reached the Soviet city of Stalingrad. The Germans were the most modern military in Europe, and outmatched practically any enemy they fought. However, the Romanians were still using majority of technology from World War I. When entering Stalingrad, the Romanian Third Army had to be moved away, because it and the Second Hungarian Army both started fighting each other as soon as the division saw each other. As such, the Italian 8th Army was stationed between them to ensure they wouldn't fight each other. However, as all the flanks were covered by Romanians, Hungarians, and Italians, meanwhile the German 4th Panzer Army and the 6th German Army were inside the city, experiencing the extreme conditions of Stalingrad, the Soviets managed to maneuver and attack the flanks, rooting the poorly supplied Romanians, Hungarians, and Italians, and leaving the Germans encircled in the city. This was nicknamed Operation Uranus. The tides of war turned, and the Germans, who had been on the offensive since the start, were now forced to begin their retreat. By August 1944, the Soviets had entered Romania, and the war was nearing its end. However, uncontent to simply allow things to continue as they were, King Mihai I organized a coup against the dictator Antonescu. On the 23rd of August, 1944, Mihai called Antonescu to meet with him and discuss the war situation, where he demanded Antonescu remove him from the war and turn their rifles on Germany. Antonescu refused, saying they must remain loyal to Germany. Mihai then replied, Dacă lucrurile stau așa, atunci nu ne mai rămâne nimic de făcut. Upon hearing the code word, Colonel Emilian Ionescu and a group of four soldiers entered the room and arrested Ion Antonescu and his foreign affairs minister, Mihai Antonescu. No relation. Following the coup, Mihai signed an armistice with the Allies and turned the remaining forces against Germany and Hungary. 
Hungary would also attempt a similar tactic, without any results, as the Germans placed Hungary under martial law and turned it into a puppet government. However, Romania would move forward with Soviet aid and push Hungary out of Transylvania, and even march to Budapest, again, just like old times. Although it wasn't all smiles and rainbows, as when the Soviet Red Army entered Romania, it entered it under the context of it being a conquered territory. As such, the Soviets ran amok through the nation, taking whatever they wanted, assaulting whoever they wanted, and in general causing chaos. There are stories you'll hear about families hiding their daughters in the attics or in the walls in order to shield them from the Red Army, who generally did as they pleased. By the end of World War II, Romania had come out on the victorious side, and as a reward was returned to North Transylvania, although Basarabia remained lost to the Soviet Union, now reorganized into the Moldavian Soviet Socialist Republic, which had lost South Basarabia and North Bukovina to Ukraine. But an exchange was given a thin strip across the Dniester named Transnistria, which was mostly Russian and Ukrainian ethnically. Ethnic Romanians in the Ukrainian SSR were then deported to either Siberia, Moldova, or Romania. Sometimes entire towns of people would be taken and dropped in the middle of nowhere in Stalin's games to attempt to keep control over the Soviet Union. The gift of Transnistria became more of a curse, as although it comprised the majority of Moldovan industrial output, its Russian and Ukrainian ethnic identity would mean it would never unite with Romania, and instead would always be under Moscow's reign. Also, the bastards took Snake Island. South Dobroja also remained under Bulgarian control, so Bulgaria was the only country to gain land after losing the war. However, in 1946, the Soviets would interfere with Romanian elections, having the communist Petru Groza take over their prime ministership. Just as Winston Churchill famously said, an iron curtain has descended across the continent. The Soviet Union had liberated all the countries it came across into communism. The nations of Poland, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, East Germany, Albania, Yugoslavia, Romania, and Bulgaria all were now under communist occupation. The Cold War had started, and Romania was trapped on the Russian side. The communists would then pull a communist and oust Mihai as the king of Romania, officially ending the kingdom of Romania. All the boomers in the audience were waiting for this guy, so let's hear it. In 1965, Georgia Dej, the previous head of state, died, and in his place, a compromised candidate was chosen, Nicolae Ceausescu. Ceausescu moved quickly to secure himself as the unquestioned leader of Romania, purging massive amounts of political opponents, changing the nation from a People's Republic to a Socialist Republic, and creating a new position called the President of the State Council, in which he would be appointed. Ceausescu became very well known in the West, and as he essentially told the Soviets they could go fuck themselves. During the 1968 Soviet invasion of Czechoslovakia, where the Soviets sent forces in Czechoslovakia in order to put down the liberalization of the Czechoslovak state, Ceausescu refused to send Romanian aid to the operation and made public televised speeches which were incredibly hostile to the Soviets and called on all nations to recognize the actions of the Russians. America liked the cut of his jib and invited Ceausescu to visit Washington. Ceausescu would also go on to make several visits to Mongolia, China, North Korea, and Vietnam and started taking notes on how to be communist and still hate the Russians. Ceausescu was also a Romanian nationalist, and as such, he claimed the Moldavian SSR as a rightful part of Romania, which didn't rub the Russians the right way. This all culminated in the July Thesis, a series of 17 points which Ceausescu was planning to use to make Romania into a global communist superpower. The problem being that he hoped to use communism, which we're about to find out, never works. Ceausescu did have some smart ideas though, including recognizing that the Romanian population was going to start shrinking, meaning the end of economic improvement. However, his solutions were hit and miss. He started increasing benefits for mothers with small children, ensuring paid maternity leave for mothers, and free access to doctors for all pregnant women. Sounds great, but then he also outlawed birth control and, and contraceptives, which all ended up doing their job, and the population of Romania skyrocketed to a peak of 22,842,000 in 1991. However, this also resulted in massive amounts of unwanted pregnancies, which led to a lot of children being abandoned. Now, a lot of orphans may not be a massive problem, but remember that all of these orphans were going into state-run orphanages. Communist state-run orphanages. And if you think your DMV is bad, wait till you hear how these kids are treated. The problems were that the orphanages were underfunded, running in conditions reminiscent of the 1700s, staffed by people who did not care and had too many orphans to handle. The situation led to many orphans being infected with a myriad of diseases like HIV and AIDS. Children often being beaten, children being moved from orphanage to orphanage without warning, and more. Children often didn't even experience the love or care of a loved one, and many grew up having a whole series of psychological issues. 
But the flaws of the communist nation don't stop there. Ceausescu wanted Romania to appear strong on the world stage. So just like Stalin before him, he attempted to export as much of Romania's resources as possible, to make it look like they had a surplus. However, this resulted in lack of resources across the state, with government-run stores often running out of material to sell. My parents often tell me stories of how they had to wake up at the crack of dawn and stand in line for hours before school in order to pick up some milk and eggs from the store, and if you weren't lucky, they'd run out before you reached the start of the line. Food was scarce in the communist country, as food was constantly rationed, and most families had to live on, a, on half a loaf of bread per person per day. Most Romanians got what they needed through a black market that began to form, as farmers would hold on to some of their produce and exchange it for mechanics doing work on their vehicles, or the seamstresses fixing their clothes. Romanian workers would also often be sent abroad to learn more about their work in other communist nations, such as East Germany, Poland, and China. The government also ran literally 1984 programs that outlined how to live healthily and claimed that less food was actually good for you in order to conserve food to be exported instead of letting the people have it. A few notable events from around the time include how in the 1976 Summer Olympics, Nadia Comaneci, a Romanian gymnast, was the first ever person in history to achieve a perfect 10 out of 10 score in gymnastics and the Romanian government gave her the title of Hero of the Socialist Labor to congratulate her. Then the Romanian oil wells started drying up, and Romania's exports began to wane. In response, Ceausescu came up with a brilliant ploy. He would sell the Jewish population of Romania to Israel, and the German population of Romania to the German countries. Although Romania was a staunch ally of the Arab League, funding a majority of Isar Arafat's endeavors, Israel accepted the proposal and began to pay for Jews from Romania to escape the communist hellhole and go to Israel. Same thing happened with the Transylvanian Saxons, leaving for the German states. Over the next 50 years, the German population of Romania would greatly decline, and the Saxons, who had made such an impact in Romanian history, gradually fizzled out. Then there is good old leftist infighting and authoritarianism, with Securitate being established. The Securitate was a Romanian secret police akin to the Russian NKVD. Securitate's favorite thing was to find political dissidents and make them disappear in the night. Ceausescu would also start a lot of stupid and wasteful projects to show Romania's economic might. These would include the Danube Black Sea Canal and the Palace of the Parliament, which, yeah, I'll admit, does look awesome, but it's still a nightmare to make. The Danube Black Sea Canal was, as the name implies, a canal between the Danube and the Black Sea. Not sure if you've noticed, but the Danube already flows into the Black Sea! The reason this was done was to circumnavigate the Soviet Union's tax fees in the Danube Delta but it cost an estimated 2 billion American dollars and still hasn't paid for itself with the shipping going through it. Then there's the Palace of the Parliament, the largest government building in the world, only behind the American Pentagon. This building was just made as a flex by Ceausescu, which is great, but people are still starving! Then there are the lists of human rights abuses done to the workers who built these buildings and... Oh. Oh god. Yeah, I'm not reading those. Anyway, the point is, people weren't too pleased with Ceausescu at some point. And by 1989, the entire system was beginning to fall apart, with the Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev taking over after a bit of a strange time in Soviet leadership. He began the process of glasnost and perestroika, which permitted more freedom in the Soviet satellite states. All the remaining satellite states took this as a sign that the jig was up and started having free and fair elections. Or, I guess as free and fair as you get in Eastern Europe. Except for Romania. While the rest of the East was slowly moving towards capitalism and democracy, Ceausescu tried to keep his hold over the people. However, it didn't go down too well. On December 16th, 1989, in Timisoara, fun fact, that's where I was born, a crowd formed to protect a pastor who had been speaking out against the communist government. The government attempted to remove the crowd and seize the pastor, but the crowd resisted and began to march through the city, chanting anti-communist slogans. The police were overwhelmed and called on the military to handle the situation. The situation then escalated, as the now armed protests began fighting back against the military with guerrilla warfare engulfing the city. The Securitate employed martial law in the city and attempted to end the revolt in Timisoara. However, many people refused and con congregated outside a large cathedral, waving the Romanian flag. However, with the Romanian emblem in the center cut out, the symbol of the Romanian revolution. The military ended up firing on the civilians, escalating the situation further. The government now started to panic, arming workers from nearby cities to go and put down the revolution. However, it turned out communism wasn't very popular and the workers joined the revolt. The next day, Ceausescu attempted to keep his air of stability up by staging a live speech in Bucharest. The Securitate mobilized people from around Bucharest and attempted to paint them as Ceausescu supporters by giving them signs of the dictator and his wife. The speech was live broadcast to the nation in an attempt to make it look like the people still supported him. However, during his broadcast, the town started booing him and shouting, Timisoara! 
stunning Ceausescu, who demanded everyone return to their seats. However, the crowd refused, and in response, the Securitate opened fire on the crowd. This entire show was broadcast to the rest of the country as everyone saw that the dictatorship was on its last legs. A riot began in Bucharest, with the military being dispatched to fire on the unarmed protesters. However, the protesters would manage to overpower the guards and make their way onto the balcony where Ceausescu was. Ceausescu and his wife managed to escape by taking a helicopter and flying away from the chaos. However, it was then that the military officially began backing the protesters, requesting the helicopter to land and hand over the dictator. The Ceausescus went on the run and escaped to the nearby city of Targoviste. <laughs> it all comes full circle. However, the couple was then found by the military and put on trial. The trial was live broadcast to the people as nothing more than a theater act to convict the dictator and his wife of all their evil deeds. After which, they were taken to another room and shot on live television. Initially, communist sympathizers attempted to hold on to the presidency, arguing that people had overthrown Ceausescu, not communism. But the Romanian people disagreed, and democratic elections began. Although the nation was freed from communism, communism still stuck around, as the old Soviet bureaucrats reinvented themselves as liberals, while changing absolutely nothing. Two years later, the Soviet Union fell, and Moldova proclaimed its independence. There were pushes to reunite the two Romanian states. However, Russian rebels in Transnistria staged an uprising and started the Transnistrian War with support from Russia, along with Galgaz separatists in the south. The war to this day remains a frozen conflict that has kept Moldova politically frozen and has kept it from moving towards the EU and Romania. During the Yugoslav Wars of the 1990s, Romania remained neutral, although true friendships die hard as Romania provided support to the Serbian military, even when it did sus stuff. But money and safety from Russia by joining NATO makes for strange bedfellows, so the Romanians allowed the Americans to stage their planes in Romania to bomb Serbia, although refusing to send its military in. In 2004, Romania officially joined the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, making it a part of the West. And in 2007, Romania made the smartest economic decision it could and joined the European Union, with Hungary actually lobbying for Romania to join the EU. The Romanian economy gradually started looking up, until the 2008 financial crisis hit and kneecapped the Romanian efforts. But since then, Romania has been gradually increasing its economic output, becoming the third largest economy in Eastern Europe, behind Poland and Russia. In 2014, Klaus Johannes, an ethnic Transylvanian Saxon, won the Romanian presidency. And in 2020, Maya Sandu, a pro-Western and pro-Romanian politician, won the Moldovan presidency, and began turning Moldova towards the West. Unfortunately for Romania, Moldova seems to have inherited all the musical talent, with the Moldovan group Ozone creating their hit song Dragos Day in 2003. Then in 2017, Sergei Stefanov, otherwise known as the epic sax guy, scored third place in Eurovision for Moldova. And finally, for Eurovision 2022, Moldova used the song Tenerlets, this absolute bop that calls for the unification of Romania and Moldova. The 2022 Russian invasion of Ukraine led Romania to increase its preparations and regional commitments. The Bucharest 9, a group spearheaded by Romania and Poland, which had been formed in 2015, began meeting more frequently to prepare the region for potential Russian invasion. In 2023, Moldova also officially passed a new law stating that the official language of the country was indeed Romanian and not Moldovan. Meanwhile, Romanian-Moldovan cooperation has reached all-time highs as about one quarter of all Moldovans now possess Romanian citizenship. Romania has also made promises to wean Moldova off of its dependency on Russian gas. And Moldovan approval ratings for the unification of both countries hit an all-time high of 50%. Although, most polls still place approval ratings at around 40%. Meanwhile, in Romania, it's at 70%. As such, the future is looking bright for these little ugly ducklings in Eastern Europe. Hopefully, reunification is in the cards, and Romania continues its climb into the upper bracket of the EU. And hopefully, Austria doesn't deny us entry into Schengen again. Please, Austria, even Hungary approved it, you little sh- Hey, uh, this was recorded like two weeks ago. So since then, both Romania and Bulgaria have been given partial entry into the Schengen area. As in, trains and boats coming in from these countries won't need passport checks, but cars are going by foot will. So that's kind of a shame, because Romania has some terrible rail infrastructure, and we really like our cars. Well, but this will at least make the traveling between Romania and Hungary by train a little more bearable. Either way, I hope you guys enjoyed. This entire history of Romania has been a massive amount of work. And even if most people won't watch this, that's fine. This is just a kind of personal project. But next video probably won't be for a while, because I have finals in January.
but I hope to upload another video sometime before the second semester starts. Oh, but shit, then I have the back to study for? Whatever. I hope you all have a great day and a happy new year. Ciao, ciao.